The image here is a crowd scene from Afrin in northwestern Syria, a primary Kurdish enclave community. And there uh, you can see it was a large demonstration in support of the movement. Afrin is currently occupied by the Turkish army and of course uh, the jihadist mercenaries that are supporting it. So uh, this was, when I made this slide, 10, 13, 19, the situation uh, in northern Syria at the time, uh, yellow being the area held by the Syrian Democratic Forces, red being the area held by the Syrian Arab Army, that's Assad, uh, dark green being the area heard, held by Hatiyot al-Sham, which was previously known as Jabhat al-Nusra, which was at one time the Al-Qaeda franchise in Syria. It is holding the majority of Idlib. Uh, the light green there is anti-Assad rebels, uh, nominally with the Free Syrian Army, that are not Jabhat al-Nusra. The blue sections, uh, light blue, is the area occupied by Turkey and its uh, Syrians that they have put together in a group called, they call it the Syrian National Army which is arguably not Syrian, not national, not an army, but uh, that's the area they're holding. And the orange section here, uh, both northwest of Manbij and north of Aleppo, is an area of joint control between the Syrian Democratic Forces and the Syrian Arab Army. Uh, the area just north of Aleppo is the area of the Sheba, which is a, a reservoir there, and also uh, the location of uh, the town of Tel Rifat. Uh, that is where many internally displaced people from Afrin moved to after they were displaced by Turkey's invasion of Afrin. So this was early on in Operation Peace Spring when they had made their first forays into Tel Abiyad and Serakanye, also called Ras Ain, and uh, this silent here that was headed towards the M4, which will become infamous soon. So uh, when I put this talk together, it was directed at Our Revolution Arlington. Our Revolution was a group that was formed up of uh, after Bernie Sanders' campaign, uh, the presidential campaign, and people who wanted to keep the Sanders momentum going into a new organization, though it's not exclusively a Sanders group. And this was a collection of statements from various Democratic politicians and candidates for the Democratic presidency, expressing a fairly universal position uh, among them that Trump's policy of a immediate withdrawal was betraying the Syrian Democratic Forces and leaving them to be uh, attacked and slaughtered by, by Turkey. Uh, this seems to have a, a broad support uh, of a position in the Congress. Um, I believe there was a recent resolution that was passed in the House that had only 60 votes against it uh, condemning Trump's uh, immediate withdrawal. So. We have bipartisan support in Congress still. What can be done with that, we'll have to see. So leaving aside the domestic politics, uh, or at least the congressional politics, let's talk about how this whole project grew up and one particular American influence, one influence uh, among many, which was Murray Bookchin's thought in social ecology, democratic confederalism, uh, Libertarian municipalism. Uh, Murray Bookchin uh, was a radical revolutionary from New York who eventually moved to Vermont and went through several stages of ideological growth over his life. You know, he was one time a you know young Stalinist who'd been sent off to organize the factories and went through a period of uh, exploring different socialist trends. You know, by the SDS time, uh, Society of, uh, for Democratic Society (SDS) that he had also become an anarchist, was famous for pinning a uh, article called Listen Marxist, where he uh, repudiated Marxism for its hierarchical tendencies and encouraged people to en embrace anarchism. He was very involved with the foundation of environmentalism in the United States, uh, so much so that I think uh, the New York Times erroneously contributed to him upon his death, uh, writing uh, Carson's uh, Silent Spring. Uh, he's written a bunch of other books that are uh, probably superior in many ways. And so here's, here's a list of some of his books uh, on the essential bookshin. And where it becomes important is I'm, I'm quoting Eleanor here, who, who may even be on the call, but that uh, the Kurdish freedom movement of Rojava, northern Syria, and the Rojava social contract is based on the pillars of feminism, ecology, 
moral economy, and direct democracy. That these principles resonate throughout the movement as a whole, tying together diverse organizations and communities on a shared basis of feminism, radical multiculturalism, and ecological stewardship. And uh, Eleanor is with social ecology, which was Bookchin's flagship institution of these, of these politics, still with us today. So uh, Bookchin uh, passed away in 2006, and uh, I had been a, a fan of, of Bookchin at that time, uh, you know, read his books, and uh, probably my longest article was actually a critique of uh, where I felt that Bookchin was not being democratic confederalist enough in regards to his analysis of the indigenous communities of uh, Northeastern America, particularly the uh, Confederacy of the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois. Uh, so I was, you know, a critical fan of Bookchin, um, and enough that uh, at the time when he passed away, I noticed very curiously that uh, the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, uh, had sent greetings uh, to his funeral, condolences uh, on his passing. Um, and that this was uh, surprising. Uh, like many people in America, I didn't think of the PKK as anything other than an orthodox Marxist-Leninist national liberation movement uh, with a somewhat unsavory past, uh, showing what little I know about it, but that this significant party uh, in Turkey had decided to look into Bookchin uh, was kind of fascinating for me. It was 2006, there wasn't a whole lot of information about this conversation in English, uh, but it was very interesting about things that were going to come. And I wanted to show here the condolence letter that the PKK sent uh, upon his passing. Uh, the Bookchin had made his contribution to the 21st century to become the century of socialism, and that those who struggle for freedom and democracy will continue to gain strength from his life and morals. His thesis advances the development of freedom, democracy, and socialism more than ever, and that the PKK has also learned from Bookchin that his contributions to our leader's thesis on social ecology will always be remembered, and to attain the democratic socialism that we envision, his contributions to the ideals of confederalism his thesis on the state, power, and hierarchy will be implemented and realized through our struggle. Hence, we will continue to make its impact. We under, uh, undertake to make Bookchin live in our struggle, and we put this promise into practice as this, uh, the first society, which establishes a tangible democratic confederalism. We hope that all social scientists, revolutionaries will attain the characteristics of Bookchin, principles, consensus, revolutionary moral values, and most of all, they practice this in life. That Bookchin has not, uh, has not died. He will live on through his work and through the works of others. PKK Assembly, August 2006. So there's a number of texts here about Bookchin, uh, communalism after Bookchin. And two I want to point out here are Democratic Autonomy in North Kurdistan by uh, Tatar, Kurdistan, and Revolution in Rojava, Michael Knapp, Anja Flock, and uh, Erkin Eboga. Uh, Two very excellent books you should check out if you want to know more about this topic. And what's really interesting about them is that the democratic autonomy in North Kurdistan shows how the Kurdish freedom movement uh, manifested Bookchin's politics in a brief window in which political activity was allowed to them on primarily municipal but also parliamentary level as part of the peace process between the PKK and Turkey. Uh, they did not have the kind of control over society that this movement would have would gain with the Rojava revolution, but it did show uh, kind of an in-between step in which when they had Turkey probably uh, at the point it had reached the closest thing it has ever enjoyed to free elections and a civil society, uh, that they were able to manifest in taking control of mayorships, city councils, uh, and start building up a cooperative sector and explore uh, some of the aspects of the ecological movement that you go to. Revolution in Rojava shows how this uh, Bookchinism or, or, or the, new, the new ideology of democratic confederalism should, could be manifested when they actually had military territorial control over an area in which they were not burdened by having to support and, and be concerned of the immediate oppression of a state. I also want to point out that uh, this movement uh, is not exclusively Bookchinist. 
you know, in many ways it is post-Marxist. Marxism is still an influence on some of their ideology, some of their decisions, some of their organizational structure, but they also take inspiration uh, from a, a variety of sources, uh, you know, not just Bookchin. But let's talk about Marxism and how the PKK uh, decided to move beyond Marxism. So this is an article excerpts from the Weekly Worker in 2012, it was discussing their change program, that uh, they, uh, PKK was restructuring itself uh, on democratic confederalism, uh, not as a total state, but if necessary, prepared to accept a principled compromise. That principled compromise being sort of like the democratic autonomy in North Kurdistan, Turkey book I was talking about. Uh, the PKK regards uh, organized uprisings and self-defense and welfare as a requirement to maintain its respect and responsibility towards itself and the people, our future in history, but the, really the solution to the Kurdish question lies in solidarity and free unity with neighboring peoples and the Kurds establishing their own democracies wherever they are, irrespective of the political borders and bringing together all Kurds of Iran, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq in a new federation and unifying all of them within a higher confederation. So what, what's important here is at this point, the PKK is no longer calling for an independent state in the classical national liberation model, one that was based on a homogeneous ethnic, linguistic, cultural identity, but rather one that existed contemporarily among a variety of cultures, but that there are in fact, uh, you know, cultural national interests that need to be expressed and lived and the organization of uh, nations uh, was also, uh, you know, necessary. Uh, and so the program was in the future going to consist of a democratic, ecological, and importantly, gender-free society, and that they envisioned not a Kurdish nation state, but a democratic confederation for the entirety of the Middle East. I, I, I do love their ambition. It is, it is it's one of their charms. Uh, part of their critique of Marxism, that it was narrowly class reductionist. That is, the driving force of society had been defined that a narrow class struggle uh, was not the only one, and the class struggle was only one of the several historical dynamics. The dominant role was played by resistance of communal society values. This is probably something that will uh, warm the heart of many intersexual anarchists. You know, it's not simply only class struggle, but that's very important, but there are other oppressions that must be simultaneously addressed by the struggle. And that was essential for us in history of uh, the opposite pole is in class and gender-based development, that all types of ideas and actions undertaken by slaves of ethnicity, class and gender, who stood against hierarchy and political power that are essential for us, and since they are drawn from a natural society. Uh, the essence of our theoretical approach is that for a democratic, ecological, and gender-free society, which expresses a synthesis on that basis. It is an ethical system that establishes a sustainable dialectical relationship with nature and that is not based on internal tyranny, tyranny and determines common features and through direct democracy. So uh, since it's the first time I am doing this webinar, I would like to check in to see that uh, the speed and uh, character of this presentation is meeting people's needs. Uh, can I get a, a thumbs up on that? You can post comments in the chat, too. Yeah, it's coming in clear. And it's neat to see the comments from the PKK back to Bookchin. I haven't seen those. Great. All right. So I will continue along. So, uh, Dula Oshalon. So in the comments on the PKK, they referenced that their leader had synthesized a new ideology based partially on Bookchin, uh, and that this was an important part of their program. That leader, if you did not know, Abdullah Oshalan, founder of the PKK, uh, among others, uh, certainly the, their, their great leader of the party in historically what was, you know, a uh, very Marxist-Leninist, let's valorize the leader kind of way. He was already looking to change the direction and ideology of the party uh, before his capture. Uh, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, the PKK, like many Marxist groups, was looking for new answers, new ideas, uh, because what they were doing was no longer working. 
and uh, they were looking for a new synthesis. Well, he didn't come upon it before he was captured in 1999, but in prison, uh, he became familiar with the works of Murray Bookchin. And it was uh, through his testimony uh, in the Turkish court and his meetings with lawyers uh, that he formulated this new idea and propagated it among his many supporters. And in the window of the peace process that he helped create is what allowed parties like the HDP, the People's Democratic Party of Turkey to come about and to put forth this new change in ideology. Uh, some critics of Oshalan claimed, ah, he is just trying to reach an accommodation with the Turkish state. He's given up on a real revolution of Marxist-Leninism. He's given up on uh, independent Kurdistan. We shouldn't listen to anything he has to say. Uh, but I think those critics are extremely unfair and actually getting quite radical, the, the radical turn that Uchulon's politics had taken. Uh, many people uh, always advise that the PKK, particularly after the breakup of the Soviet Union, should drop its socialist program, that it should instead, uh, like the KDP in Iraqi Kurdistan under Barzani, become more of a social democratic party. Maybe one that involve, in, encourages like social spending or whatever, but not one that is, uh, has critique of capitalism as part of its central core. Well, Ojalan never gave up critiquing capitalism. Uh, criticizing capitalist modernity is still at the heart of the program, but he wanted to extend it to also criticizing patriarchy. Patriarchy all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia and, and the priest kings of the ziggurats. Uh, deciding that, in fact, the patriarchal form, the patriarchal form of government and the establishment of the priest caste is, in fact, the original sin uh, in society as far as he's concerned and what has allowed class relations and eventually capitalism to develop. So the picture we here have, uh, there's a couple. We have some pamphlets that Ojalan has penned where he solidified the new ideology and presented it to the party and the movement. Uh, up in the right-hand corner, we have you know, the PKK with their Ojalan flags. Uh, and at this time, they'd already adopted the new KCK flag, the Kurdistan Communities Union, that new confederation of Kurds across different states uh, in their traditional guerrilla uniform. And here we have the liberation of Raqqa from ISIS. And this is a ceremony put here together by the YPJ, the Women's Protection Units. Uh, now I'll point out that the YPJ, uh, YPG, uh, are the People's Protection Units and the Women's Protection Units, originally founded by what was uh, the Democratic Union Party. What's, what's missing from all of those words? Kurds, Kurdistan. Formation of these parties specifically was not supposed to exclusively be on the basis of Kurdish nationalism. Yes, they were part of and supporters of the Kurdish freedom movement and did much to advance Kurdish identity and culture and language in Syria, but it is not exclusively for Kurds, and this is very important. Uh, YPG, and in general, the women's wing of the Kurdish Workers' Party itself, very supportive of the change in ideology, particularly given its focus on a gender-free society. Here at the liberation of Raqqa, uh, YPG is, is celebrating Oshalon as their leader, uh, but you'll also notice a couple other things. Here is the flag of the SDF, Syrian Democratic Forces, here is the YJS flag. The YJS flag is the flag of the women's protection units of Sinjar, the Yazidi community in Iraq. All right, Kurdish politics are complicated. This is, if you would believe it, a simple chart of organizations, the major organizations in Kurdish and also in Assyrian politics in the region. And I want to point out just a couple of things here. The KCK is the umbrella that was founded by the PKK. Also under that umbrella is the PYD, the Democratic Union Party in Syria, and militias that it formed, YPG, YPJ, and uh, a political coalition, Tebdem, that the PYD created uh, by their political alliance with the Syriac Union Party. Syriacs being Assyrian people, an Aramaic-speaking people, uh, predominantly Christian, who uh, usually all they share in common with Kurds is they happen to be neighbors and are often oppressed uh, by a Arab, Turkish, 
uh, majority in their respective countries. Uh, also, while it's not a direct line under the KCK umbrella, I mentioned the HDP earlier. That's the People's Democratic Party of Turkey. The HDP is a legal political party in Turkey that wins uh, local and regional elections. They have active members of parliament. Their political ideology, in terms of things like a gender-free society, socialism, opposition to capitalist modernity, uh, support for mother tongue education, uh, all these sorts of things are identical to the program of the PKK and the Democratic Union Party, the PYD in Syria. The one place the HDP differs from the PKK is that the HDP does not support armed struggle. Uh, and of course, how could they, uh, as a legal political party in Turkish parliament, be advocating for violent overthrow of the state? Otherwise, their politics are the same. And essentially, the HDP was set up uh, by supporters of the Kurdish freedom movement in the window of the peace process to give an outlet for this movement to participate in a legal political manner uh, if Turkey was going to try to be at least a bourgeois parliamentary republic. All right, Kurdish politics actually gets really, really complicated. This is a map of different organizations and we'll just move along. So HDP is a significant, significant force in Turkey. What you're looking at here is the last thing close to a free election that ever happened in Turkey. June 7, 2015. The purple area is the electoral districts that the HDP won in that election. You'll notice that that purple area also happens to correspond uh, with what is traditionally thought of as Kurdistan in the Republic of Turkey, where the majority of Kurdish people uh, have historically lived uh, in Turkey. Uh, one exception being Istanbul uh, here gets about a million votes uh, now. Why are there a million Kurds in Istanbul? Well, because Turkey's war, counterinsurgency efforts against the PKK, destroyed more than 3,000 people and displaced uh, more than a million people. Uh, and many of them moved to cities. It created urbanization throughout the Southeast, but also many other Kurds moved to the capital, Istanbul, where they had both better economic opportunity and thought they may have less political uh, repression. The crowd shot you see behind us here is the New Ross Festival, the Kurdish New Year Festival, held in what is usually regarded as the Kurdish capital, the largest Kurdish majority city in Turkey, uh, Diyarbakir, also called Ahmed, uh, celebrating their new year when they're look, coming into political consciousness. Look, we're allowed to do our demonstrations. We're allowed to have a political party. We're allowed to be on the street uh, expressing both a Kurdish identity and a political movement. And this is how many people we can turn out. It's like the whole city turned out. And the co-chairs of the party at that election uh, were Sivlatan Dermatash and Figen Yuxendog. First off, you should note, co-chairs. Two, co two, two, two chairs. One man, one woman. Every position that they try to run for municipal councils, for mayors, and for the co-chairs of the party, organizationally structured to be two chairs, one of which must be a woman. Uh, this is part of their idea of making a gender-free society a structural component of society uh, that is non-negotiable from their, from their viewpoint. Also, to note, uh, Figen Yuxendag is not a Kurd. She is Turkish. They envision the HDP uh, being the political party of all people of Turkey, but particularly uh, highlighting and supporting Turkey's ethnic minorities. Kurds uh, in their variety, uh, not just Kermanji speaking Kurds, but Zazaki speaking Kurds from Dersum, like Salat and Dermatash, Armenians, Circassians, Laz, uh, Christians, Azidi. They wanted this to be for, for, for everyone, but particularly minorities to get representation and to challenge a Turkish identity, a Turkish nationalism that only saw a role for people who were Turks. Uh, the Turkish slogan, happy is he who calls himself a Turk, is a central part of the nationalist ideology that is dominating the Republic of Turkey. And rejection of 
homogeneous ethnic, cultural, linguistic nation states is a key part of the Kurdish freedom movements, the PKK, the PYD, and HDP's politics. They think that the homogeneous nation state is part of the problem and part of what needs to be challenged along with capitalist modernity and patriarchy. And so uh, 6 million votes, 13.12% of the elected. Uh, this makes the HDP the most successful Kurdish majority party of all time. Uh, by comparison, I believe the most recent election in Iraqi Kurdistan uh, for the KDP, KDP got about 600,000 votes. So 10% of what the HDP polls. So back to Syria. This is mostly the relationship at the start of the Rojava revolution in 2012. Uh, the Democratic Union Party got together with the Syriac Union Party to form the movement for a democratic society. They both had militias. The Democratic Union Party had its YPG and YPJ, the People's Protection Units and Women's Protection Units. The Syriac Union, uh, Syriac Mil Union Party had the Sil Syriac Military Council and the Beth Neherin Women's Protection Forces. So both parties have armed women's militias, and both parties are pressing for a gender-free society. Uh, the military wing combined together eventually to form the Syrian Democratic Forces, and Tebdim eventually formed a civilian council to match the SDF called the Syrian Democratic Council. Uh, this was all part of the shared governance structure that they established uh, over time, starting at the revolution in 2012, up into this formation you see uh, that came about in 2015, as the self-administration of North and East Syria. Early on in the Rojava revolution, they called it the Rojava revolution, Rojava being West for Kurdistan. But by the time of the formation of the administration, they actually dropped the name Rojava specifically so that this multi-ethnic, multicultural, gender-free project could be more representative of not just Kurds, but also Arabs and Assyrians and Armenians and even Turkmen. All right, so part of that is because of the specific ethnic demography that this revolution arose in, which is North Syria, primarily in three cantons, Afrin, Kobani, and Hasika, particularly the city of Kamishula. So in this map from Azadi, uh, and this other map, I believe, that came from uh, maybe the New York Times, um, you can see that the Kurdish population primarily spread into three cantons, three clusters in northern Syria. Between them, separated by the section in yellow, which are Arabs, and the section in purple, which are Turkmen, and in red, you have these Syrian Christians. So particularly in Hasika, you have an extremely uh, heterogeneous society uh, with Arabs and Kurds and Assyrians living next door to each other, the street over each other, the town over from each other. This is not 95, 98% Kurdish majority area like Hakkari uh, just across the border in Turkey. This is a very multicultural society, and Syria itself is extremely multi-ethnic, multicultural. Problem, though, is that the Ba'athist government is organized on the basis of an ideology of Arab nationalism. Arab nationalism uh, to be the uniting factor across religions, uh, so much so that uh, Kurdish expression, Turkmen expression were to be repressed, uh, and that a Syriac, a Syrian identity, was ideally from the position of the Bathkist government to be rolled into an Arab Christian identity. So as things progressed, I said that the new administration in 2015 had even dropped the name Rojava from their polity. Um, they had regional elections in 2017. And I want to mention them to talk about how this movement had gone, grown from beyond simply being a Kurdish movement to a more multi-ethnic, uh, multi-religious format. Uh, there were two main political blocs, the HNKS, which was the Kurdish national bloc, uh, 
which is made up of a lot of parties that were once supporters of Barzani, but had gone independent so they could continue to support this political structure that the PYD had made, and the Democratic Nation List that had been organized by the PYD and the SUP. Uh, you'll notice here that it's not just the PYD and the SUP. There's a good dozen Kurdish parties. Uh, there is also uh, Arab parties and Assyrian parties, in addition to the CRP party, like the Assyrian Democratic Party, who uh, early on hadn't had the best relationship with the PYD, but were brought in uh, to this new coalition structure uh, by the efforts of the movement to have more inclusion. Uh, and since I'm talking to a socialist group here, the, there, there is a risk with the method in which the PYD has built this coalition uh, because they try to incorporate as many groups as possible. Uh, some of these groups aren't as left and opposed to capitalist modernity as the PYD and the Syriac Union Party are. Some may be even to the left of the PYD on some of these issues, but some are definitely not. So the risk here is that this coalition that they built uh, primarily to be the political wing of the military coalition that was fighting ISIS and also to govern the area, uh, risk moving from what we would call a united front of the left to a popular front against, you know, an Islamic fascism of ISIS, of Hatir al sham uh, of that. So also see their the elections took place. They took place in what was primarily uh, the area where there were a lot of Kurds, not exclusively Kurds, but a lot of Kurds. And what's missing here is Manbij, Raqqa, Deir uh, undeniably Arab majority cities. Uh, they were supposed to, after the regional election in 2017, uh, move on in 2018 to have an election for the entire federation. Before that could happen, Turkey invaded and occupied Afrin, taking over, you know, what really was one of the ideological hearts and economic hearts of the revolution, uh, causing a lot of chaos, and they have not yet organized a election since. Uh, and at this time, it doesn't look like they will have one unless something can be worked out now with the, the Syrian government under Assad. We, we shall see. So after uh, those elections in 20, 2017, they were trying to form a new party called the Syria Future Party, which from the ground up would be explicitly explicitly multi-ethnic to match their ideas, but also favoring the ideas they support, like a gender-free society. Uh, here are their co-chairs, uh, Hebrin Khalif, a Kurdish woman from Derek, and Ibrahim al Kaptan, a uh, Arab uh, from Manbij. Uh, I'll note here that Kaptan was part of that initial Syrian revolution that so many Arabs and Kurds participated in, in Manbij, that he was actually the head of the Revolutionary Council of Manbij for 15 days. Uh, as politics goes, it was only 15 days, but he was still involved in the movement. But in 2014, some of the militias that occupied the area broke his legs by shooting him and imprisoned him in 45 days. After he got out of prison, he came to northeastern Syria and threw his lot in with the Syrian Democratic Council. Uh, I have a longer story here about the recent execution, the assassination, of uh, Hevron uh, Kalaf, uh, who was his co-chair, most likely killed by a Turkish-backed militia, an Islamist militia called Ahara Shakia on the M4 road uh, just this last week. Um, she was rather brutally uh, killed. Her face and body was mutilated beyond recognition by multiple gunshot wounds. Um, I believe there's going to be an editorial, an op-ed op in the paper, Washington Post Tomorrow by Ahed al-Hindi, uh, who was her friend and comrade, also an early Syrian revolution that came to, to support the efforts of the Syrian Democratic Council and feeling that that actually holds more of the ideas that they were initially seeking uh, with the revolution than what has become of the Free Syrian Army now as the Syrian National Army under Turkey's call, or Hatir al sham the, uh, the Al-Qaeda franchise. This is unfortunately uh, Heaven's car. So, we're talking about this ethnic diversity that is made up uh, of this polity now and its civilian wing, its population, and its military wing. Amy Hoffman Holmes uh, is, a, is a friend of mine that uh, I've gotten to know pretty well here. She's a, a think tanker in Washington. Uh, I ask please that you don't hold that against her. Uh, you know, 
uh, I, I've had enough conversations to know with that she's uh, she's read Marx in German, so uh, she she does know where some of this movement's coming from. So uh, Amy is probably the only person to do an actual demographic survey of the current Syrian democratic forces and to literally ask them what do the members of the SDC want. But here I wanted to highlight uh, some of its ethnic stenography. So the icons here are actually the people she got to interview. And this is actually only part of her study, but this is the ones from uh, uh, some questions she was showing. 391 participants. Uh, supposedly the SDF weighs in somewhere around 60,000 people under arms right now. Uh, but she was trying to, to be representative over what they believe the total percentages were. And they are. Uh, SDF may be as large as 50 to 70 percent Arab, 30 to 50 percent Kurds, 5 percent Christians, 2 percent Yazidis, 2 percent Turkmen. By almost any way you cut it, Kurds are no longer a majority of the SDF. Uh, maybe not even a plurality. Uh, and so this movement has changed quite a lot. Uh, we remain to be seen. Uh, some of this large growing of the SDF, though, happened through a process of conscription uh, and how many people will continue to be part of this military force as Assad's regime moves into the area formally uh, will remain to be seen. But it's not new. Uh, the SDF itself came about together by a political coalition that was formed before the Battle of Kobani called Burkin al-Furat, which has the awesome name Euphrates Volcano. And that coalition was formed up with not just the YPG and YPJ, and not just the Syriac Military Council, but Arab groups uh, like Liwa Shwa Atrib, Liwa Sultan uh, Salim, Liwa Al Tahir, Al Sanadid, which is a Shamar militia in northeastern Syria, and uh, Liwa Thwar Al Raqqa. So many Arab groups uh, came together to, in fact, form this body as well. So what were they building uh, in terms of a grassroots basis? Well, if you go back to those early discussions on democratic autonomy in Bakur, their idea, which would probably be familiar to any bookchinist, was to start from the bottom up at the neighborhood assembly. And to build from the neighborhood assembly to a city assembly, to the province assembly, to a democratic Congress. And that they also wanted to see not simply elected representatives in these upper levels, but that also specifically delegations, representatives from civil society actors like socialist movements, women's movements, uh, professional organizations to also have a seat at that table at the top, but that things would flow up uh, from the bottom uh, to form this. Uh, and so it needed to have uh, different representation from ethnic parties and political parties. Uh, and that it would also have a variety of regional commissions to deal with ecology, economy, education, language, religion, culture, science, diplomacy, women, and young people. Uh, critics, say Turkish nationalists, would accuse this of being a parallel state to the Turkish state. Well, maybe. Uh, the definition of state is uh, not really one that is all that solid. They simply saw themselves as a polity organizing independently of the Turkish state. And here we come to how they built it in northeast Syria, northern Syria, starting again at the base of the commune with 300 to 400 people in households, then to the neighborhood assembly, then to the district council, and finally, early on, it was the People's Council of West Kurdistan, Rojava. Uh, but again, eventually they had changed the name to the Democratic Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria, dropping Rojava from the name. Again, you see the regional committees that they wanted to organize by and a, di a distribution of power between the Legislative Council, Executive Council, Municipal Administrations. All right, so given that they organized this basis of a democratic participation in civil society, I wanted to talk about something that rarely gets talked about, particularly in the US, uh, which is their approach to challenging capitalist modernity and how it differs from the Soviet model or even a strictly communist model. Uh, of course, it's not discussed much in the US, uh, usually when they talk about women's fighters, the democratic process, because of course, uh, in the United States right now, 
uh, anyone who suggests that we should have nationalized health care is regarded as the equivalent of Stalin. Uh, while the movement was using U.S. arms and had U.S. support, it's not something that they were trying to highlight. But while I was in uh, Rojava, uh, they knew who I am, and uh, we got to have lots of conversations about the cooperative economic model they were building. Uh, and uh, I, I pulled up, I think, some good information about it uh, that I'm going to share with you now. But first, I wanted to talk to you specifically about the ideology that was driving uh, those details. And this is actually from an interview that I conducted with the Economic Commission. So the important here is that this is how they, this is how they see their own project. This is how they self-define their economic project to me when I was there in July 2019. They defined the Western world as capitalist, and that by that they meant that people were deprived from participation, that they were restricted to being servants, uh, and that the owners were only a few, and that it was a centralized state uh, had monopolized an economy under an oligarchy. So centralized state power that was supporting an oligarchy of economic interests. Uh, they wanted an economic society. They want an economic society that's comprised of all parts of society and the decision-making project pro process of the economy, including women and youth. That they want the economy to be democratic with large participation, that it needs to be based on a democratic paradigm and that this should challenge capitalist modernity, and that they actually see this century, the 21st century, will inherently be a conflict between a democratic uh, economic model and a capitalist hierarchical oligarchical model, uh, that they're trying to have their economy bridge the gap uh, of a class society so that everyone can enjoy the benefits of the society to create an egalitarian way. They see a communal economy that could uh, engage in distrib distribution communally, uh, and they take their inspiration here from Ocean's writings on this, that it by necessity has to be socialist. And familiar to almost all socialists, the phrase, each person gets what they need from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Uh, and that the basis of the economy and this is where they might dis uh, uh, differ with uh, some centralized models of Marxist-Leninism, is that the base unit of the economy is its smallest union, the commune, the economic equivalent of their base political community of the neighborhood assembly. And so, all right, well, who owns the land? I asked them. Is it the co cooperative that works the land that owns it? Is it the commune that is the smallest political unit that owns the land? Or is it this democratic autonomous administration as a central hierarchy that owns the land? They told me all three own it together. But more importantly, the land itself cannot be sold. The land is a communal inheritance. This is similar to a concept that Bookchin points out in terms of that only the use of the land could be temporarily distributed, uh, usufruct, uh, but that the land itself cannot be uh, alienated from, uh, it, it cannot be alienated, you cannot derive profit exclusively if you are not involved with the use of it. And so they, they want to reject uh, landlordism and particularly also uh, ownership by foreign entities. However, uh, they have not fully implemented this plan. Uh, they currently do not interfere with private land ownership, saying that we cannot force them. That previous revolutions that expropriate land by force were not successful. We are taking a step-by-step -step approach to communal ownership. We do not have the power to fight all private ownership now, but we will eventually abolish it. But I want to highlight here, their plan is to eventually abolish all private land ownership for a communal model of land ownership. And they had not yet achieved that, partially because of the existential crisis they were in fighting ISIS and being surrounded by hostile states. However, they do control a lot of land in northern Syria, partly because that land was already centralized under the ownership of the Ba'athist state. I think the majority of agricultural land was already owned, controlled by the Ba'athist state before the Rojava revolution. 
when uh, the Ba'athists and the Syrian Arab army withdrew from northern Syria to focus on uh, their control of Aleppo and Damascus and Homs and the like, uh, the autonomous administration here stepped in to take control of society and organize the economic basis and to make sure that the harvest came in. Uh, and their preferred method of organizing and distributing this land, however, was not on the basis of the Central Economic Committee making all the decisions and people being essentially conscripted into labor forces. Instead, they decided to embrace a model of cooperative economics in the context of a market economy. So while the political basis is based on communes, the commune decides that it picks a project it wants to do like it votes that it wants to do a bakery or a clinic. Uh, but a limitation of this is that these projects are limited to the scale of the commune. Uh, the commune would do the planning of what they wanted to do, and then they would approach the administration to get some resources to do it if they did not have the resources unto themselves. But the commune makes the decision first. The commune may decide they want to create a bakery and thus a bakery cooperative to go with it. That flows up to a council decision and then an administration decision if they need the capital to create that bakery. This was a bakery I went to in Hasika that had excellent bread. Uh, and so they are, however, functioning uh, this cooperative on the basis of a workers cooperatives within the context of market allocation. So they still have currency, they still pay wages, and the currency they're using is still the Syrian pound which is a, 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 a currency that is by no means under their control. They have wages uh, that they pay out and that people join into the cooperative by investing money to do it. However, you can uh, essentially take a loan from the cooperative or work into your basis for the cooperative to have your share. Uh, the number of shares that you can have is limited and the number of cooperatives you can participate in is also limited. Uh, the administration here is not setting price controls, uh, not setting the prices anyway. The committee of uh, the cooperative sets the price for the goods they're selling. However, in some cases, the administration does set a ceiling. Uh, they claimed, uh, when I spoke with them, that actually as much as 50% of their economy right now in July 2019 was actually cooperative. Uh, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to know uh, whether that's exactly the case. So much of the work being done in northeastern Syria itself is agricultural, and so the majority of the cooperatives are agricultural. Uh, so th this, this, this could actually be true. And part of that is they claim about 60% of the land is held in common, while 40% is privately owned. They're, Short-term aim was to meet to almost 80 to 90% common land. But again, they wanted to do this on a voluntary basis to get more and more people uh, to engage in this. So I uh, wanted to point out where some of this is also with the ideology of Bookchin. Uh, here we have uh, Eric and Ayaboga and Revolution Rojava that the American libertarian socialist ecologist Murray Bookchin defined the ideal economy as a municipality led by a moral economy that is under democratic control. That he argued that the commune's control over the economy represents the highest developed form of confederalism and that the same principles being applied to the economy of Rojava, mainly the Kurdish populated north of the Syrian state territory that was liberated in 2012 and which came up from the popular uprisings. So uh, Eboga here is actually seeing uh, this economic model under control of the communes and the cooperatives as the highest state of democratic control that Bookchin envisioned. So join the cooperatives based on money and work to participate. Uh, the lowest share you could have in a cooperative is one, the highest share is five. People with capital can join and participate in the cooperative. Uh, and the state can be borrowed from the cooperative fund and paid back in accordance with conditions specified by the cooperative. An active member is the one who participates in the cooperative work with their mental, physical efforts. And the financial member is one who participates in the cooperative's work with their money only. What's important here is the active members uh, are the ones that have votes. 
on the conditions of work, what it's going to be like. Well, the financial members can uh, gain profit uh, from their participation in it. And some of these cooperatives are primarily worker cooperatives, like you see here at this sewing shop that I visited in Hassock in July 2019. Others of these cooperatives are uh, almost like your uh, you know, grocery cooperative where the, a minority of the cooperative members are workers and a majority are uh, essentially consumers. Uh, this was the case at a chicken growing cooperative I went to in um, Hasika as well. The, I was told that two families there were responsible for, I believe, something like 100,000 chickens. Uh, and that the most of the majority of the cooperative members were people who joined because they liked to buy cheap chickens. Uh, chicken actually is the primary animal protein that is being consumed in northern Syria right now. Uh, and they plan to be completely economically independent on chicken production by next year. Uh, you also see here uh, some of the specifics about capital in starting up the cooperative that initially uh, a particular ratio of the profits that come annually through the cooperative need to be reinvested back into the cooperative fund uh, and then later on that ratio decreases so that the cooperative itself uh, has more control over its production but early on uh, many of it is, is reimbursing that initial investment so the cooperatives are one thing, but another aspect is one of the places I went to was Genoir, which is held up as sort of an ideal village that they want to build, a women's village uh, in northern Syria. Genoir is exclusively for women and their children. No men live in Genoir. Uh, and they've planted almost a thousand trees there. About 80 people live there. Uh, and it was envisioned as, a, as, a, as an alternative. But as an economic model, I think it's also important to look at because it is also uh, a commune uh, that was designed to be as self-sufficient as possible, uh, but also would still engage with trade with areas outside of the community. So inside the community, things were communal, but they would sell their wheat, they would sell their watermelons and whatnot to the rest of Syria. And one thing I have not talked about so much is the importance of the women's revolution in Rojava. Now, the cooperative economic model, having taken over 50% of the economy and 60% of the land, is massively important to talk about the changes in society. And the democratic model from the grass steps of the democratic councils and the communes and the assemblies, extremely important when it's contrasted against a centralized party state under the Ba'athists, which is or seems to be controlled by the dictatorship of, of Bashar al-Assad, but increasingly under the dictatorship of Vladimir Putin on what is actually happening. Uh, so those two things are revolutionary to themselves. But the women's revolution is extremely profound in Syria. I spent about a week in Iraqi Kurdistan before coming over to uh, Rojava, uh, and the presence of women in society uh, is just so more apparent and abundant on the ground, in the street, in the market, in the political structures, in the military wings. It's full women's participation. Now, obviously, this is not universal, but it was noticeably different to me in just passing through a normal day uh, while I was in Rojava that women were far more empowered and far more a part of the economy and political process than they are right across the border in the Kurdistan regional government. Uh, to give you a comparison, the Kurdistan regional government has the lowest employment of women in the region. Something like 18% of women uh, have occupations in Iraqi Kurdistan. And while the goal here in Rojava is they want all women to be participating uh, in the economic, political, and military forces of society. Uh, now it's not universal, but part of how they're addressing things is through the cooperative model. So you don't have to form a cooperative uh, in Northeast Syria, it's voluntary uh, to do so, but there is a great uh, enticement to do so. One of the reasons why you want to form a cooperative in Northeast, Northern Syria is that there's no bank in Syria. 
No banks at all. There was a bank in Kamishalo that at one time used to pay out civil, civil servants, employees, and retirees, but Assad stopped that a few years ago after the autonomous administration had taken over. So if you want capital to start up your firm, you have to try and find a private individual to loan you this capital, or more than likely, if you want to start up an enterprise, you need to come to the administration. He will be happy to give you capital as long as you do it on the basis of their cooperative model. Uh, so they use this cooperative model, they see the cooperative economic model as their primary, uh, primary method of addressing inequality and poverty in Northern Syria. It's their primary tool to address this, is to creating the formation of these cooperatives. And one of the aspects uh, of it is that the cooperatives uh, have actually also gained a lot of popularity, particularly among poor Arabs, because it gives them uh, their first opportunity to actually run their own enterprise, which would not have been possible for them under the previous Ba'athist state. And this has gotten a lot of buy-in uh, from Arabs uh, throughout uh, northern Syria. Uh, in fact, I met one of the economics commissioners, one of the members of the economics commission, he wasn't a commissioner, but one of the members of the economics commission uh, was in favor of the economic cooperative model and supporting it, even though he did not like Marx because Marx was the atheist and he was religious and he did not like the women's revolution because he thought he should have multiple wives. The population has a mixed consciousness. Uh, however, he was willing to work side by side with women in the Economics Commission because the economic incentive for participating with the cooperatives he believed in and thought that was a good idea. So he was willing to tolerate not having multiple wives uh, in a more patriarchal society uh, because there was this economic incentive to do so as just a regular member of the cooperative economy. So some of this is going to be very familiar to people. Uh, but I included this in my talk when I was talking with the Arlington folks because they were not so familiar with the situation and how quickly uh, the decision was made for the Syrian Democratic Forces to essentially accept a compromise with Assad and Russia uh, to come into the area. And a larger part of that has to do with, with Afrin. And I wanna talk briefly about Afrin to contrast the occupational uh, of Turkey and its jihadist mercenaries against the good governance model uh, that I believe has been established by the Democratic Autonomous Administration. So first off, and we can use this to show the difference between the civilian councils. At the top, we have the Afrin City Council. Uh, you'll immediately notice men and women. And here, all men, not a single woman on the Vichy puppy council that Turkey set up to administer Afrin. Not a single woman, not even for symbology. So at some level, they decided that having a woman would be a political symbolic threat to their rule over conquered Afrin. Uh, for education, I haven't had talk so much about education yet, but the Democratic Autonomous Administration has completely taken over education in northern Syria from the Ba'ath state. And among it included uh, mother tongue education, which was not only Arabic, but also in Kurdish, Aramaic, uh, or, uh, the Assyrian language, and also Turkmen for the Turk Turkmen communities. Uh, meanwhile, when Turkey came into Afrin, they started a process of Turkification. So they instituted, these militias came in, and uh, unlike the autonomous administration, which abolished uh, polygamy and also made divorce far easier to happen, uh, they introduced forced marriages, as well as engaging in beheadings, uh, looting of the community, uh, and the oppression of uh, religious minorities, such as forcing the Yazidis into forced conversions uh, and destroying uh, religious uh, locations and cemeteries. Uh, here is some of the jihadists that were occupying, Northern Afrin being very specific that they regarded all the Kurds as infidels and that their plan was literally to pluck their heads because they were ripe. Uh, 
they were happy to sing the Nasheeds of ISIS. Uh, many people who were once in ISIS have now find themselves employed in Turkey's uh, militias. Here you have one of the Christian cemeteries that was being destroyed. Destruction of a Christian church by airstrikes. Tearing down of Kawa the blacksmith, who is the uh, hero of the Kurdish New Year story, a cultural symbol, and uh, some supporters of the Frisian army celebrating the destruction of this symbol of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Kurdish identity. And even ancient history uh, was not to be uh, protected. Uh, this is the Syrio Hittite temple of Ain Dera, thousands of years old. Uh, it was not even Kurdish, uh, but the Kurdish people did love it. Uh, and uh, Turkey hit it with an airstrike uh, because it does not want to tolerate uh, anything other than a particular Sunni Arabism. Uh, it had no military significance whatsoever. Ironically, the tomb of Ataturk in Turkey also has uh, Syrio-Hittite lions. They moved around it. And then there was massive looting uh, of Afrin. They stole the tractors, the motorcycles, uh, you know, the olive trees, anything they could steal in Afrin. They did steal to take back to Turkey to be resold. So the loss of Afrin was a huge economic devastation to the model, uh, cooperative economic model they were building in North Syria. Uh, it was a huge part of their cooperative effort because many of the industrial workers from Aleppo, which is the industrial heart of Syria, moved 2013-2014 to Afrin because Afrin was regarded as more safe. And they brought with them their skills and their hard work and their capacity to self-organize to build up the cooperative economic model. While the economic model of cooperatives in Jazeera and Hasika is primarily on the basis of agriculture, the, uh, the cooperative model in Afreen was actually textiles. They were producing something like a million pairs of blue jeans a month, in addition to their uh, olive economy. And then you also saw aspects of Sharia law imposed in Afreen, uh, mandatory dress codes, uh, kidnapping of women, these sorts of things. Uh, and then there was the displacement of the Kurdish population of Afrin uh, after Turkey came in. And this is, I think, in the first month or the first couple of months, more than 150,000 people had been displaced, uh, including 50,000 from Afrin City. I believe the numbers is more like 300,000, though today in testimony in Congress, uh, Ilham Ahmed, who is from Afrin, said that with the addition of also many IDPs who came from Aleppo, it was more like 800,000 people from Afrin had been dis displaced. So essentially the entire Kurdish population of Afrin uh, has been forced out and that its entire uh, political governance and cooperative economic model uh, was utterly obliterated by Turkey's occupation of Afrin. And the world uh, largely did nothing about Turkey's occupation of Afrin. Uh, barely was it criticized in Europe or the U.S. Uh, there was no U.N. resolution calling for Turkey to leave. Uh, you know, some of the supporters of the Rojava revolution around the world did organize around it, but most of the world was completely silent about it. Uh, the People's Protection Forces and uh, Women's Protection Forces lost more than, I think, a thousand fighters defending Afrin from Turkey's occupation, but ultimately they could not uh, maintain the control of the polity and organize an evacuation of the city center in three days. However, to this day, an insurgency continues to fight Turkey and the Syrian National Army in Afrin. And this ethnic demographic change was part of Erdogan's design. Uh, here we have Erdogan in a speech he was giving to the Turkish population, claiming that the whole point is that Afrin is 55% Arabs, 35% Kurds who came later, and 6 to 7% Turkmen. The whole point is to turn Afrin uh, to its real owners, uh, that being the Arabs. Uh, but in practice, it's actually Turkmen who are calling the shots in Afrin. So the entire point for Erdogan uh, was an ethnic demographic change of Afrin to make it majority Arab again, uh, which uh, it, it was not. And so how much of this is also about Erdogan's territorial expansion 
and a neo ottomist plan to have Turkish borders be in accordance to uh, the national pact uh, determined by the Ottoman parliament in 1919. This is an extremely important part of the ideology of the electoral base that backs Erdogan in Turkey. They believe this is actually what he is trying to do, uh, an area dominated uh, by the Turkish state from Afrin to this whole strip of northern Syria over to the Zagros Mountains where the PKK is, including Sinjar of the Yazidi people and including oil-rich Kirkuk, which has a Turkmen minority community in it. To this day, the Turkish state still says they should be in control of Kirkuk. Also, Erdogan is, likes cosplay, just, just so you know. And so here, oh, was it only three weeks ago? Only three weeks ago, Erdogan was at the UN General Assembly with his plan of demographic change uh, and ethnic cleansing that he presented to the entire world with this map. His plan is to bring one to two million Syri Syrians who are currently settled and living more comfortable lives than they would have in Syria, uh, you know, with roofs over their heads and houses with jobs in Turkey and force them uh, into Northeast Syria. Problem is, Northeast Syria still has camps of internally displaced people uh, living in tents, uh, one of the largest being the Al Hall camp, uh, which includes 70,000 uh, people, including many women that were once uh, married to Daesh fighters and their children. But there are lots of other people still living in camps in Northeast Syria. So where would this one to two million people live uh, if they were brought into Syria? Well, the idea is they would take over the homes of Kurds and Assyrian Christians uh, and secular Arabs that would free, flee uh, Turkey moving into the area. Uh, originally, the safe area was gonna be an area between Tel Abiyad and Ras Al Ain. Uh, then it was gonna be this whole border strip to 1.2 million. But then, and this actually is not uh, Kurdish propaganda or PYD propaganda, this is a map from the Andalou Agency, essentially the Turkish state news agency, saying that if they go all the way to Raqqa and Deir Ezzor, that they can shove three million refugees currently living in Turkey into this zone. Uh, now, one thing to keep in mind, many of these refugees are not from northeastern Syria. They are from Ghouta, they are from Homs, they are from Damascus, uh, and the goal here would be to push the Kurds as far south as they can and form an Arab population belt, particularly a Sunni uh, religious population belt, uh, to seal demographically the border between uh, Turkey and the Kurdish population uh, that has become very secular uh, and very leftist in its orientation. And here you see the uh, attacks that are going on in the safe zone and the initial parts of the fights, not limited to the area between Tel Abiyad and Serkani, but also the major metropolitan areas of Kamishalo and Kobani. And you see how well this walks over with the map of uh, expansion uh, for a neo-Ottoman dream. To go all the way to Raqqa and Deir Ezzor is to capture this Syrian portion of uh, a neo-Ottoman ideology. And here we see what happened in the first two days of Operation Peace Spring, ironically named, and more than 100,000 people were displaced, the communities they were coming from, and yes, being shoved into the border. One thing you'll notice is that they were not going through the Samalka border crossing that I crossed in July to come into northern Syria. Why not? Uh, because initially, the Barzani government that is backed by Erdogan uh, was blocking the crossing of refugees into the Kurdistan regional government. Uh, some thousands have now crossed. They require you to have a sponsor in KRG to cross. And if you don't have a sponsor, you can pay a bribe of about $200 uh, to get across. The average wage in Assad-controlled Syria is currently about $50 a month. The average wage in Syrian Democratic Forces territory 
thanks partly to the cooperative economic system created by the autonomous administration, is more like $150 a month. Uh, civil society workers in the autonomous administration get $135 a month and sometimes perk like food or housing, while the uh, armed militants uh, of the movement, whether it's SES for security, Syrian Democratic Forces, YPG, YPJ, get approximately $200 a month, and all co-chairs of anything in the administration, co-chair of an economics commission, co-chair of an education commission, co-chair of the executive president of the Syrian Democratic Council, get $200 a month, the same as the fighters. So essentially, uh, the KRG is demanding somewhere between one uh, and uh, four months salary uh, for the privilege of fleeing Turkey's attacks. And here uh, we're updating as the conflict was going on, the territory that they were taking control of. And then, uh, so when Turkey attacked Afrin, the YPG, YPJ held out for a month hoping that the world would intervene to do something to stop Turkey's assaults, to at least create a no-fly zone, something that the movement still wants to happen in North Syria. But in Afrin, no no-fly zone ever came. Uh, Russia seemed to have traded Afrin uh, for Erdogan pulling uh, Syrian, free Syrian army fighters out of southern, uh, southern Syria and also out of Ghouta. Uh, so that the Syrian Arab army could have an easier job taking it over. Similar to how Erdogan and Putin made a deal that Erdogan would pull fighters out of Aleppo in exchange for Erdogan being allowed to do Operation Euphrates Shield, where they took the area from Jarbalus to Al-Bab to stop the Syrian Democratic Forces from uniting the cantons from Manbij to Afrin, which would have allowed them to seal the border uh, and have a contiguous territory. And so very quickly now, you know, within 10 days rather than a month, uh, an agreement seemed to have been reached between the Syrian Democratic Forces and the Assad government uh, and Russia for Assad, the Syrian Arab army, to move into some of these towns, to raise up the flags, and to start taking over border posts to block Turkey from coming in. It's still unclear whether Russia is going to uh, close the skies to uh, the Turkish Air Force, but it seems to be that the current ceasefire is now holding. And we all hope that a ceasefire will continue and there'll be no further uh, displacement uh, or, or war. And I, I just wanted to end on some happier pictures uh, that I took uh, while I was there. Uh, this is one of the fields with the new, one of the, some of the thousand trees that have been planted in Jinwar and the sunflowers they use to, uh, to mark the area. Uh, here was a, a, a park in Amude, one of the first towns I was in when I went to Syria. I did not expect the first thing to do the night I was in Amude, in, in, in Rojava, was to be to uh, ride in a Ferris wheel. Big, big Ferris wheel and rocket too. This is a uh, memorial for the martyrs, a large cemetery in Kobani. Uh, what was happening here actually was a memorial service uh, in solidarity uh, because Turkey had done an airstrike in Zagros Mountains in Kandil that had killed a number of PKK members, including a PKK member who came from Kobani. And the town turned out in a massive way uh, to support this. I also went to a pro-PKK demonstration that was happening in Amude for the same reason while I was there. Uh, this is from a conference that was held outside of Amude about what to deal with ISIS. Uh, one of the things that, that I, I abstractly understood, but didn't really get until I, I, I was there, is how much of northern Syria is not sand and death that Trump might explain, but actually an extremely fertile farmland. Essentially wheat fields and cotton fields and agricultural production, as far as you can see, all along that northern strip. One of the problems with Erdogan's plan to displaced the entire Kurdish population from the northern, building, uh, northern area, in addition to emptying out the cities, is it would actually be taking over some of the best farmland in Syria. And forcing these farmers uh, to scratch out a living uh, in the desert area uh, between uh, the north and the Euphrates. These are some shots from uh, Amude, and uh, this is the uh, 
the best uh, uh, chicken place uh, in uh, Kamishima. And this was from the celebrations for the July 19th uh, Rojava Revolution, uh, where the town in Kamishalo turned out to uh, participate. Uh, the young kids learning Taekwondo. The YPJ was very interested in the children learning Taekwondo, Kung Fu. Uh, and uh, you can see, uh, while well, people do wear uh, hijab in Northern Syria, uh, a lot of it is extremely secular. Uh, in fact, the revolution has made it more secular. Uh, you still hear call to prayer. Uh, don't believe the hype that the YPG ended the call to prayer. Call to prayer still happens, but in the Mude, as an example, very few people actually still attend mosque. Uh, they have other things to do. Uh, and you see the blue jean is the ubiqu ubiquitous uh, preferred form of clothing. Uh, very easy to do when you have a textile industry uh, and cotton. I asked actually ask the Economic Commission in Kobani what their primary economic sector was. And I was surprised they did not say agriculture. They actually said their primary economic, uh, economic sector in Kobani is now textiles. Uh, but many textile workers having come, having been displaced from uh, Afrin. And uh, finally, uh, Esnachim, uh, which is uh, some graffiti that I took off in Amude, which means uh, I am not leaving. And that, that you could see that in many places throughout northern Syria. It was a, a statement of people, Kurds, Arabs, Assyrians, that they were not fleeing uh, northern Syria, that they were intended to stay, come what may. And finally, an appeal for Hebesur, uh, the only organization, actually, that's one of the few organizations doing humanitarian work on the ground in northeast Syria. Uh, if someone ever asks what they can do financially to help, uh, it's a safe to put your money in Hebesur. Uh, you can do so legally uh, without problem. And uh, they do real good work from healthcare to aid distribution. All right. I think I will now open things up to uh, conversation. If I can figure out how to Thank do you that. so much, Flint. Let's all, I'm gonna clap. Everyone can unmute and clap. What a talk. <laughs> um, oh, hard to do without seeing your lovely faces. Oh, okay, well, we can, we can put some of our faces up if you wanna unmute your, uh, your yeah. video. Yeah, stop share. There we go. Um, and uh, go ahead. You can, I don't think, I think we're few enough that you can just ask Flint directly a question, unmute yourself and, and ask a question. Oh, well, I see one question here I can start with from uh, uh, Symbios right. Revolution. Yeah, uh, that's me. Was, ah, will <laughs> Arabs of SDF join Syrian Arab army? Mm. It's a very good question. You could also ask, will Kurds of the Syrian Democratic Forces join the Syrian Arab Army? Will uh, Assyrians of the Syrian Democratic Forces join the Syrian Arab Army? Will Turkmen join the Syrian Arab Army? Uh, what is going to happen here is extremely unclear. The Syrian Arab Army is deprived of manpower and actually quite weak uh, based on its historic numbers. And uh, it is a extreme problem for the Ba'athists and the Assad regime, and they also have conscription. Uh, however, many of the Arabs that have joined the Syrian Democratic Forces were members of the Free Syrian Army. They were rebels against Assad and don't want to participate in the Syrian Arab Army. Likewise, the YPG, YPG could have at any time had Assad been willing to compromise on something Reflag themselves from YPG, YPJ to National Defense Forces or, or whatever. And over the length of this conflict from 2012 to 2019, that never happened. Today, uh, interestingly enough, there was a joint military patrol in Kobani by the Russians and the Kobani local military council of the SDF. This seems to suggest that uh, Russia and Assad may be willing to tolerate both the existence of the newly formed local military councils and the YPG-YPJ as some sort of uh, 
semi-autonomous elite force uh, and that the compromise with Turkey will be the local councils stay where they are as they are organized, the YPG, YPJ formally withdraws 30 kilometers from the border, uh, but that uh, otherwise Putin uh, and Mike Sinch Assad are actually not going to change the military or political system that has been set up in northeastern Syria uh, because it's already embedded. It's already controlling the security situation. It already knows the people, has the support of the populace, and removing that entire structure and bringing people from Damascus and Aleppo and um, is, is probably not going to work very well when they have to deal with both a ISIS insurgency and whatever games uh, the Syrian National Army and Turkish MIT is going to want to get up to. So we may see some reflagging. We may not see reflagging. It might be that uh, Russia likes how this structure is set up. Uh, in the past, Russia has actually supported the rhetorically the push by the Syrian Democratic Council for a more decentralized, federalized Syria. And they may be willing to tolerate this polity continuing on in some sort of recognizable fashion to us. On the other hand, it could all be lies and they plan to liquidate and kill everybody who's not Baptist. I don't know. It, it did seem today that Putin said that Assad should have his land back. Yeah, what, is, what does that mean? Does that mean it's going to be a Assad Baptist cop on every block? Or does that mean he just wants to oil revenue, right? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I think for Putin, the only thing better than a dependent Assad would be both a dependent Assad and a dependent region in the Northeast that he can play off against each other. But we'll have to see if that, that is in fact the plan. Um, I have not spoken specifically about this with the Syrian Democratic Council representation here in the US, which at the moment includes Ilham Ahmed. I hope to do so tomorrow. As you know, facts are changing very quickly on the ground, but they're not, they're not as, uh, as despondent or defeated as uh, some of our, their supporters might think. Uh, most of the people in the leadership of this movement uh, lived under Baathism for their whole lives as political operators, as activists often facing torture in prison or whatever. And from their perspective, they're actually looking at an extremely weakened Baathist state uh, versus their extremely empowered position. Uh, while the, we've done a lot to try and stop Turkey's incursion uh, and the damage done there and the loss of life uh, has been significant, in the context of the Syrian civil war and of the Syrian democratic forces own fight, they did not lose much in the last 10 days, except that land between Ras Alin and Tel Abiyad, two small towns. The SDF is still intact as we know it. The polity is still intact as we know it. The cooperatives are still cooperatives. The communes are still communes. What exactly is gonna happen in the future, we're gonna to need to see, but it's not as if uh, the movement has no power in Syria anymore. That's not the situation. They may have to accept living under the Syrian flag, but the position of the movement has always been they were not seeking a separate state. They supported the territorial integrity of Syria. They did not want to uh, break up Syria with a new border. They wanted a decentralized democratic state. Now, how democratic can it be with Assad and the Ba'athists because still controlling Damascus? I don't know. Can it be more decentralized? Probably. We, we need to see. Who else has a question for Flint? Do you think I that, um, okay, hi. oh, um, first of all, Flint, that was an amazing amount of information packed into a really short time. Um, I think uh, I'll definitely look over the slides later. Um, my question is whether the changes in the on the ground have changed internationalist involvement um, and what the role of internationalists has become um, as uh, 
things on the ground have changed? Um, I, I know that several individual uh, international fighting volunteers have returned to the U.S. Uh, I know that for myself, uh, uh, having been in there in July and wanting to go back, you know, a day after I left, that I probably won't be going back anytime soon. Um, because the, uh, the Assad regime will probably take a hostile notion to internationalists who are supporting the Rojava revolution. Um, but uh, I know that members of the Rojava Information Center or who are internationals are still on the ground in Rojava. Thanks. So uh, will they continue to do stuff via the internationalist commune then publishing, or do you think they'll have to go quiet for a while? Well, we're going to see. I mean, I believe that the administration wants to hold on to as much of their autonomy, uh, including like the international support as they want. Obviously, one thing Assad is going to want to do is take over foreign policy and take over controlling what foreign nationals can be in the area. The agreement so far, uh, as depicted by the Rojava Information Center, says that the Samalka border crossing with Iraqi Kurdistan is still under the control of the SDF and not being turned over to the Syrian Arab army. That implies that they'll still be able to engage in uh, uh, some limited kind of foreign policy uh, and trade with the rest of the world. One thing that we're gonna try and push for here in Washington, D.C. is that Washington, D.C., rather than continuing to maintain blanket sanctions across all of Syria, with the exception of the Syrian National Council, say, look, you have to give people something. Give Northeastern Syria a sanction-free zone that allows them to engage in trade with the world, and they then can say, and Assad can trade with us, right? This would allow Syria to get important pharmaceuticals and reconstruction company and all this sort of thing to come into the country contingent upon Assad allowing this autonomous administration to continue to exist to manage that portion of the trade. Economic sanctions themselves right. have proven impossible. That they've never, they have never caused uh, an authoritarian regime to change what they're doing, right? They don't cause the population to rise up and overthrow. It mostly just creates misery. But if you say, well, you can let economic trade exist, as long as this democratic autonomous administration is still part of it, that might be something that could influence Assad's behavior. And that is one of the few things the American Congress could give us. But I will highlight here, for the entirety of the partnership between the Syrian Democratic Forces and the Pentagon, the sanctions applied to the Assad regime also apply to the Syrian Democratic Council. They could not sell oil to the West and then spend that money in America on something as simple as a lobby group or to import tractors, right? So, and the reason that was the case is, well, Turkey wouldn't like that. Well, there's a whole lot of hostility to Turkey at the moment and its policies, and lifting these sanctions would relieve a whole lot of misery uh, in uh, Syria, uh, and additionally, uh, it seems Congress has an appetite for changes. I'm told that they plan to impose some kind of sanctions on Turkey, specifically on Erdogan and his ministers uh, next week. And at the same time, they also have planned the U.S. Congress to recognize the Armenian genocide for the first time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, you mentioned that earlier in the call. That's very exciting. Flint, you had provided to some people a link to your slides through Google, and I'm wondering if I can put that in the chat or? Absolutely. Okay. One, one day I will get around to writing an article. In all your spare time. Um, well, I, 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 you know, the, the nature of the Syrian Democratic Council's office and the American Rojava Center for Democracy, which is essentially an advocacy and lobby group that's being organized as a 501c4, um, is going to change. Uh, we're, we're aware of that. Uh, Congress is still talking to us a lot, a lot more than they talked to us in the past, but the material situation will be such that now that the U.S. is completely out of Syria, 
and that under a Trump policy wants to withdraw from the Middle East overall, uh, that will encourage them, one, to stop talking to us, and two, to normalize relationships with Turkey to the extent that that's possible. So our activity is going to need to change from talking to a lot of politicians, talking to a lot of think tanks, talking to a lot of journalists and uh, 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 Pentagon and State Department to trying to build up these politics in a grassroots way uh, in the movement, in popular movements here in America, uh, so that we can act better in solidarity in the future, uh, because this movement is not defeated. It is not going anywhere. You know, they still have their six million voters in Turkey. They still have everything uh, that they had yesterday in Syria is still there, except now there are also Russians and the Syrian Arab army taking up military positions, with the exception of control of Ras Alain, uh, Serkayane, and Tel Abiyad area. Hypothetically, uh, we could see Turkey withdrawing from all of northern Syria and the Democratic Autonomous Administration coming back into Afrin. We, we, don't, we don't know, uh, but we'll, we'll have to see. I, I was going to ask, you mentioned the Pentagon uh, relating directly to the SDF. It, for what's left of uh, any kind of foreign policy apparatus in the executive branch in our country, is there, how, is there any awareness of this social and political uh, reality on the ground in, in Rojava? Yeah, they, they, they know, but they don't, they don't want to talk about it except to the limited areas in which it's, it's palatable, which is women's rights, democracy, ethnic inclusion. This is all good. Uh, they, never, they don't want to discuss the cooperative model. And frankly, they had all of Northeast Serbia still under economic boycott. So like there's not even trade. Um, you know, Trump's rhetoric about the oil uh, and we could secure the oil, oil production in Northeast Syria, or Syria overall, dropped through the floor to such an extent that Syria used to be an uh, oil exporter, and now Syria is an oil importer. In the SDF territory, they were still doing enough oil production to meet their needs which is also partly mitigated by their control of the hydroelectric dams along the Euphrates River. The majority of electricity they use is from the hydroelectricity, not from oil generators. And fun note, I found the electricity more steady in Northeast Syria than in Iraqi Kurdistan. Iraqi Kurdistan is extremely strange. It has some very nice glitzy, bourgeois upscale streets and buildings built by Turkish construction companies. But you go a couple of blocks in either or direction and you are back to Ba'athist era quality. And that's in the capital city of Erbil. You go to some of the other villages and everything, things haven't changed in 30, 40 years. Um, one thing is that their transportation policy is nuts. The Kurdistan Regional Government's transportation minister said that tra mass transit transportation was actually better under the Ba'athist state in Kurdistan regional government than it is today. There is, I believe, one taxi driver for every four people in Iraq and Erbil. Uh, Kamishalo, however, has uh, instituted uh, buses. And I, I will actually talk about their mass transit plan because it raises an interesting issue of class conflict, about the only class conflict story um, that I have heard from Northern Syria. Uh, which was related to the taxi drivers union. So you have the cooperatives, which have their democratic decision-making power, but in some industries, you have labor unions. Drivers, for taxi drivers and bus drivers is one. Another, the hydroelectric uh, worker, dam, dam workers, are also a union, which are democratically organized to represent their issues. The taxi drivers organized a strike against the administration's price controls on the fee uh, for taxi cabs. So the resolution of the strike, the strike was happened, the strike was not repressed by violence, they had their strike and you know, expressed their demands, and the administration and the taxi driver union reached a compromise. One, the taxi drivers would be allowed to raise the cost of their rides. However, the administration was going to mitigate this by using administration funds 
to first fund a fleet of vans as a form of public transportation, which has now grown into a fleet of buses, both city to city and within municipalities uh, to meet the demand of people uh, for these uh, for mass transit. Uh, you know, they, in our own Kurdistan, they have plans to build a train since 2008. And for all their money uh, and all their control, not, they've not done it. Other questions? I want to ask if you witnessed the political, if you witnessed assemblies or on the, at any level, neighborhood, assemblies or if people get sick of meetings like we do? <laughs> I was there in July 2019. So in July in Syria, it is really hot, like 104 to 109. So I couldn't go to any of the school sessions because school was out and uh, they didn't have any assemblies uh, that I could go to while, while I was there. I'd only ask about uh, the best sources for keeping up on the information. I mean, I, you mentioned Rojava Information Center that I do follow. Right. Uh, are there any others that are stellar and trustworthy that you would recommend? Sure. I mean, ANF is a really good source to follow, and that's that's Move Media, uh, Hawar News, uh, Twitter uh, is a very good way to follow it. If you follow it, I have a I have a Twitter list uh, on my Twitter called the uh, Digi Mesopotamia. Uh, and that is where I've collected a number a number of accounts, uh, but that but that's ANF is usually a really good uh, really good source, uh, and there's still stuff good good stuff coming in out of things like War Magazine. So what's your Twitter handle then? <laughs> oh oh, Flint Spark. I'll Flint put Spark. it in the chat. Thanks. I will follow you forthwith. Thanks. How does ArcDem fund itself, and do you accept donations? Uh, ArcDem funds itself out of the pockets of our members, um, and actually, we are uh, we had a terrible law firm, the same law firm that uh, the Senior Democratic Council was using, and one of the first things I did was fire them. Uh, but they actually somehow confused our entire incorporation process. And we had been given an EIN number, which apparently was not true and not functional. So we we're redoing all that. So we've mostly just been doing cash. And our activities are very limited what they needed money for. We would occasionally rent a national press club or whatnot. In many ways, we were really just getting started uh, with, with our stuff. Uh, the organization didn't officially form until fall 2018. We are going to be engaging in a fundraising effort for Hevesor. Uh, by coming together with the New England Curtis Association, a similar one, one was done by NECA uh, for the Afrin campaign, where they raised uh, you know uh, tens of thousands of dollars. So we're going to be supporting that, and I'll let people know about that when it happens. Um, and we're going to need to really evaluate uh, what we're going to be doing with the money, uh, and so how much to, to ask for. So right now, if you want to spend money to help folks, I say give it to Hevesor. I've put the link in mm -hmm. there. And also, Flint, are you calling for people to come to DC? If is yes. there coming? Yes. So uh, we believe that uh, President Trump uh, invited President Erdogan to come to DC because they're best pals and everything. And there's been nothing from the Trump administration to say that invitation is going to be rescinded. So Erdogan is supposed to arrive in and speak with Trump on November 13th in Washington, D.C. So we'd like to have a massive demonstration about that. And we are also calling for a spokes council to help organize that demonstration to be held on, uh, I believe it's Tuesday, the 26th? 29th. The 29th, Tuesday the 29th in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, so if you all would like to participate in that spokes council uh, in person, uh, we'll be having that to organize for things and I'll pop about some more news, but the big day, November 13th, Washington, D.C. 
uh, we'd like to have a we'd like to have a large demonstration, as large as we can manage it, and maybe this being the stepping stone to to reorienting our activity to being more engaged with the left. I know that ArcDem has been very focused in DC. That's what the Syrian Democratic Council wanted, but the movement's going to have to what we're doing has to change, and we need more engagement uh, with uh, the grassroots in America uh, and. For, for the presumably near uh, continual future. We may go through a name change as well, because that's what the movement does. Maybe we'll just join symbiosis. That's a good idea. <laughs> that is a very good idea. <laughs> we are, uh, we're not exactly sure which people from the Syrian Democratic Council will continue to be in the US. Uh, there may also be a potential that some other people from Syria may find it advantageous to seek asylum in the US. Uh, you know, a lot is changing. Could you say something about um, actions in the US related to HDP and uh, Kurdish question in Turkey? Sure. Uh, so the HDP has been under massive repression since winning its uh, position in parliament in 2015. The Turkish parliamentary system says that if a party running for election does not get at least 10% of the vote, its seats go to the largest party in parliament. So when HDP wasn't crossing the threshold, it couldn't run as a party, otherwise its seats would go to Erdogan and the AKP. When the HDP crossed that threshold, not only could they finally sit in parliament as a party for the first time, and in fact, Became, had the third largest number of seats, surpassing the nationalist Mehep. Uh, it also cost Erdogan his parliamentary majority. Erdogan uh, decided not to form a coalition government, refused to work with any other political party, and instead called for new elections in November. And in that time, did everything he could to repress the Kurdish movement. Since that time, there was also a coup attempt, which was also used to repress the HDP and the Kurdish freedom movement. And uh, there were a uprising uh, called the, it's been called the City Wars, uh, that Erdogan brutally repressed with violence, uh, that leveled portions of uh, Sizre and Sur and uh, portions of Ahmed and Sernak, uh, a brutal, brutal repression. Uh, and at one point, uh, Erdogan was able to regain his parliamentary majority, but the HDP is still getting more than 10% of the vote, so it still participates in uh, parliament. However, I believe about 10 of its parliamentarians were arrested. Uh, hundreds of mayors were fired from their positions and replaced with uh, political appointees by the AKP, and they all just redid those elections again. Uh, HDP still crossed the threshold. HDP still won the mayor positions in most Kurdish municipalities in the area, and it's still, still a thing. However, if they want to step out to protest uh, the invasion of Syria, their parliamentarians, their mayors are completely surrounded by police uh, and not able to effectively demonstrate. Uh, Turkey is in a very, very oppressive uh, society right now, the number one jailer of journalists in the world. Uh, tens of thousands of academics have been dismissed, tens of thousands of people in prison. Uh, people who are dismissed from the positions are not also not allowed to leave the country. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty dire situation for them. But even despite all this, uh, HDP is still uh, winning elections in its area. Not only that, is HDP acted as the effective kingmaker uh, in the municipality election in Istanbul, the largest city in uh, Turkey. Uh, there was hope that HDP showing its weight in supporting the uh, secular, quote unquote, liberal uh, JHP party, CHP, uh, would cause Erdogan to recalculate what he was doing and perhaps stop repressing people so much and maybe not involves invade northern Syria. This was entirely wrong uh, and something for the movement to reflect on. Uh, there was a bit of controversy before the election when there was a, a story from Abdullah Ushalan saying that the HDP should remain neutral in the election and not support the CHP. Uh, and it turns out Erdogan went through, continued with repression, 
continue with the attacks. And only that, but the CHP supports the AKP's military intervention in northern Syria. Right. So, um, the so what, power, what we're doing in the U.S. is that what you want to do? Um, uh, I guess one of the points I wanted to draw from what you're saying was over the last couple of years, HDP organizing in Turkey has not been able to um, soften the blow of Erdogan's incursion into Syria. Not at all. In fact, um, I will take this controversial position uh, according to uh, peace studies uh, and liberal supporters of bourgeois democracy. I believe that the repression currently being focused on the Kurdish, Kurdish freedom movement and their oppression of their language and cultural identity in political expression is directly related to the electoral threat the HDP poses to Erdogan's power. That is, their participation in the parliamentary election system is what actually ended the peace process between the PKK and the Turkish government. And also Erdogan's desire to get Turkish national support, since he can no longer count on Kurdish votes, is driving his hostility to the movement in northern Syria. He has to feed the gray wolves Kurdish red meat. So it's actually their participation in the bourgeois parliamentary democracy that is the political calculation that Erdogan makes domestically to repress uh, the HDP and by its extension, Kurdishness. Interesting. So you might suggest that in the absence of the um, Kurdish involvement in the electoral process, there might have been, um, I don't know, some sort of like detente or some other. Um, right. Well, yeah. b b before the HDP crossed the threshold, okay, Erdogan was a reformer on this issue. Erdogan is the administration that allowed the Kurdish language to be freely practiced. Erdogan is the administration that allowed Kurdish television stations and Kurdish children programming and allowed large new Raz festivals. Uh, and the idea that he was putting forth is his neo-Ottomanism is that we were all united under the Ummah. We are all Muslims together. Eh, we're all Muslims together. And uh, Turks and Kurds are brothers. And we need to accept this. And that the way to resolve this conflict between Turks and Kurds is not in an Ataturk identity of the Turks as a monocultural force of Turkishness, but to embrace an Ottoman idea which recognized that there were different ethnic communities in the Ottoman Empire that should have some degree of autonomy, self-governance, independence, and their own identities, right? So Kurdish mayors weren't a threat. The Kurdish language Erdogan did not regard as a threat to the state he wanted to build. What is a threat is that they cost him his parliamentary majority and voted against his increase of power uh, for the executive presidency. Uh, that is the two political sins they have committed against him. Before the 2015 election, I think it was in 2013, uh, Erdogan even hosted Saleh Muslim, leader of the PYD, in Ankara for talks about how they could work together to end the Assad regime. Uh, and you'll note that Turkey did not really start its aggressive military actions in a large way in northern Syria until after HDP crossed that electoral threshold in 2015. The Turkish rhetoric is that the peace process ended because uh, Yerege uh, the the Kurdish youth, YDGH, uh, dropped a couple uh, crooked border cops that were probably on the take from ISIS. Uh, but uh, to my understanding, uh, killing two cops usually does not cause states to engage in uh, large-scale warfare across three countries. Note to end on, um, as we've reached our time. Couldn't be a better and, one. <laughs> um, so Flint, again, thank you so much. Um, and uh, we will have this recording available somewhere. We'll figure out where to put that. 
and um, your slides have been posted in the chat. Um, and uh, I guess we will end with that, but all of you who are still on the call, thank you so much. Um, I can. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Galex Bas, Shebash. So, Captain. Bye. Bye. Thanks for organizing, Cora. My pleasure. Look for more from the Symbiosis Political Working Group. Right, Boyd? Well, yeah. <laughs>